Hey guys, it's Greg with Apple Explained, and today we're going to explore the history of Jonathan Ive, where he came from, how he got involved in product design, some of his career achievements, and how he ended up as chief design officer of the most valuable company in the world. This topic was second place winner of last week's voting poll, and if you didn't get to vote, make sure you're subscribed. That way the voting polls will show up right in your activity feed, and you can let me know which video you'd like to see next. So Jonathan Ive is a legendary designer who is responsible for the look of some of the most iconic products like the iPod, iPhone, iPad, and iMac. And although you may be very familiar with the products he's designed, you probably aren't too familiar with the man himself, since he's known to be a private person who avoids media attention. But in this video, we'll cover what we do know about Jonathan Ive, starting with his early years in the town of Chingford, London. His childhood circumstances were comfortable but modest. His father, Michael John Ive, was a silversmith, and his mother, Pamela Mary Ive, was a psychotherapist. They had a second child, Allison, two years after their son's birth. Jonathan Ive attended Chingford Foundation School, later to be the alma mater of David Beckham. While in school, Ive was diagnosed with dyslexia, but it never seriously affected his education. Ive was curious about the inner workings of things throughout his childhood and was fascinated by how objects were put together. He would carefully dismantle radios and cassette recorders, exploring how they were assembled and how the pieces fit. Although when he tried to put the equipment back together again, he didn't always succeed. In a 2003 interview conducted at London's Design Museum, he said, I remember always being interested in made objects. As a kid, I remember taking apart whatever I could get my hands on. Later, this developed into more of an interest in how they were made, how they worked, their form and material. Although he recognized his passion quite early in life, it took him some time to figure out what exactly he wanted to design. His interests ranged from furniture and jewelry to cars and boats. Ive's father took him on tours around London design studios and design schools, and young Jonathan Ive took a special interest in a car design studio. He later looked into attending Central St. Martin's College of Arts and Design in London, famous for their automotive design program. But Ive found the school to be a bad fit, due to other students being, as he put it, too weird since they were making vroom vroom noises as they did their drawings. He looked elsewhere for a higher education and eventually turned to Newcastle Polytechnic in the north of England. Ive decided product design would become his specialty. It was during his college years when Ive further developed his signature design style based on German Bauhaus tradition. This design philosophy embraced a minimalist approach, where designers should only design what is needed. And these were the same principles followed by former Braun designer Dieter Rams. And you can see similarities in the products each of them have created. I've also received several design awards throughout his academic career, including the Pitney Bowes Walter Wheeler Attachment Award and two scholarships from the RSA. After he graduated, I've took a trip to Silicon Valley to explore up and coming design studios in the Bay Area. He immediately fell in love with San Francisco and hoped he would return there sometime in the future. But until then, I've returned to London to work for the Roberts Weaver Group, one of the top design firms in Britain at the time. Here, Jonathan Ive became friends with many of his co-workers, including Clive Grinier, who quickly moved on from RGW to join another design firm and eventually started his own consultancy. But I've remained at RGW and eventually experienced some troubles with the company, mainly due to him being fresh out of college. First, they didn't give him a substantial raise that he requested even though his talents warranted it. Second, RGW declined a special request from their client Ideal Standard to assign Jonathan Ive to their project. They rationalized the decision by saying they had a studio of 12 designers and there was no way they could send a fresh graduate like Ive to go work with one of their clients. Jonathan Ive eventually left RGW out of frustration and joined his old friend Grinier's design consultancy called Tangerine Design. And although Ive had more freedom over his designs at Tangerine, they were often rejected by clients due to expense or deviation from the company's existing product line. Another problem was clients accepting Ive's designs, but re-engineering them only to look half as good as it should have been. These rejections deeply frustrated Ive, who poured his heart and soul into each product he designed. But in fall of 1991, a visitor to Tangerine Design would help change all of that for Jonathan Ive. His name was Bob Bruner, and he was scouting Europe for outside design firms to work with Apple on a secret project called Juggernaut. And Bruner was determined to get Jonathan Ive on board at Apple. At the time, Apple was being run by John Scully since Steve Jobs had been forced out six years prior. 
The desktop publishing revolution was putting Macs in businesses all over the world, and Apple had just celebrated its first quarter earning $2 billion in revenue. With all this cash, Apple was expanding its product lines, and Scully was investing heavily in R&D to speed up development of new products. I've accepted a contract to consult on the Juggernaut project, but he was still working under Tangerine Design. Apple wanted him to focus on developing mobile devices like tablets and laptop hybrids. I've went to work and produced something called the Folio Keyboard that featured its own CPU, network jacks, and a trackpad. He also created a transportable desktop called the Macintosh Workspace that had a built-in pen-sensitive screen along with a split keyboard that folded underneath and to the sides when not in use. At the end of the project, Jonathan Ive and the other designers at Tangerine had developed about 25 models that were reduced down to four principal designs. Bruner was very impressed with Ive's contributions and thought his designs stood out because they weren't based on anything that Apple or any other computer company had done before. Now that's quite an impressive amount of talent considering Ive was just 26 at the time. Apple then flew him out to their Cupertino campus to make a final presentation and offer him a job. Bruner pulled Ive off to the side and said, if you really want to create something radical, you should come work for Apple full time. Ive agonized over the decision. He had enjoyed working with Apple, but wasn't sure if he wanted to leave both his homeland and his work at Tangerine. He also wasn't sure whether his wife Heather would want to move to the States. Now we all know he eventually took the job, but what's more interesting are the factors that influenced his decision. He appreciated that Apple offered a supportive work environment where he could focus less on day-to-day -day business operations and more on design as a craft. Also, he had become frustrated with consulting. Working outside a company made it difficult to have a serious impact on product plans with true innovation. And finally, he got to live in San Francisco, the city he'd fallen in love with years earlier. In September 1992, at age 27, I've accepted a full-time position at Apple, and his first assignment was to redesign the Newton message pad. The first version was a failure, but Apple was hoping to change that with its second iteration. I've worked tirelessly on the project and involved himself in every last detail, even traveling to Taiwan to fix manufacturing problems. But no amount of effort from Ive was enough to save the Newton. Apple had made marketing and engineering mistakes that plagued the Newton until it was finally discontinued. So it may not have been a commercial success, but Jonathan Ive's Newton was a design success. It earned him four of the top awards in the industry and the honor of being featured in the permanent collection of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. Now during this time, Apple was experiencing tremendous financial success and had more money than they knew what to do with. But just three years later in 1995, all of that changed. Windows 95 was released and cheap PCs began to fly off the shelves, undercutting the Mac. In the first quarter of 1996, Apple reported a $69 million loss and laid off 1,300 employees. This caused Apple's focus to shift from developing high-quality, well-designed Macs to pushing out the cheapest machines they could possibly make. This was truly a period of no innovation at Apple, and it destroyed Jonathan Ives' morale. He said, All they wanted from us designers was a model of what something was supposed to look like on the outside, and then engineers would make it as cheap as possible. I was about to quit. But before he could, John Rubenstein, his new boss, talked him out of it. Rubenstein gave Ive a raise and told him that eventually the company would turn around and they'd have the opportunity to make history. And with Jobs' return to Apple in 1997, Rubenstein was exactly right. Jobs brought focus to not only the company, but to Ive's design group. Because he was young and inexperienced as a manager, Ive wasn't exercising much discipline or leadership. It was creative chaos, with each designer working on their own projects with virtually no coordination. Jobs refocused the design team and got them working together on a new project called the Mac NC, which would later become the iMac. The team only had nine months to get it from design to production. And to meet this deadline, I've implemented a radical, integrated design process that transformed the way Apple developed its products. The workflow was so successful that it became permanent, and it's essentially the same system the design group uses today. So the iMac was released nine months later and ended up being the best-selling Mac in Apple's history up to that point. Jonathan Ive had finally found a company that gave him the freedom to practice his craft effectively without limitations. In fact, part of Jobs' reorganization of Apple included giving the design team power over any other group, including engineering. And because Ive was head of design, he had a tremendous amount of operational power at Apple, second only to Steve Jobs. 
I've went on to design almost every hit product to Apple's name, including the iMac, iPod, iPad, iPhone, Apple Watch, and AirPods. But a fundamental problem with Ive has been raised quite often, and that is, what will happen when he inevitably leaves Apple? A similar question was asked about Jobs before he passed, but Ive's circumstances are quite different. It's his hands, heart, and mind that are directly designing these products. And no one is quite sure whether his unmatched talent can be passed down to other members of the design team. But I'm confident that if any company could figure out a way around that obstacle, it's Apple. So that is the history of Jonathan Ive. And if you want to vote for the next video topic, don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.